Okay, we're live. There we are. There we go. Broke. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Reasonable Doubt brought to you by the Harris County Criminal <clears throat> Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, along with my co-host, Tulio Vela. Julio, what's going on, my friend? Very excited. Very excited. You look like it. <clears throat> I'm pumped. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to clear your throat. <clears throat> I know. Is he... Uh, that's what happens. As I'm excited. As... You know why I'm excited? Why are you excited? Because this week I was finally, I, I, I finally have been, I found out that I'm part of a generation. Oh, is it the Zennials? That's right. It's your Zennial. I'm a Zennial. Interesting. I feel like I belong somewhere now. Before, <laughs> before I just felt like I didn't have a home. <laughs> I saw that article. I wasn't Gen X. It. I wasn't this millennial stuff. Now I have a home. I didn't read it. I so think I feel good. I'm millennial. You? Millennial. Millennial. Pat? I'm just freaking old. <laughs> <laughs> Our guests this week, ladies and gentlemen, are esteemed appellate and writ lawyer, Pat McCann. How are you, Pat? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> we brought you in as an expert. Oh, that's frightening. Tonight. I know, right? <laughs> for anything. It is. Also joining us for the first time this evening from the Houston Press, Megan Flynn. Megan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, we're glad to have you on. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, you're, you got the uh, lead article this week in the Houston Press, so well. we're... We're excited to be talking about that tonight. We'll talk about a lot of other things going on. We will open up the phone line starting around 8.30ish, maybe a little before. If you guys want to call in, 713-807-1794 is the number. Also have Twitter up, at HCCLA underscore TV. Um, guys, and this is, you know, this is right up your alley. First thing I want to talk about, Pat, because it's Fifth Circuit. Um, I, I'm really troubled by this case. And... So with the Fifth Circuit this week, uh, over they, they turned, reversed and rendered, a $2 million verdict, a civil rights case, for a man who was found actually innocent. Then goes to, takes, a, takes his case up in a, in a civil court, gets a jury to award him $2 million, and the Fifth Circuit takes it away. I... I, I I just have a fundamental problem with this because what keeps happening that's so frustrating to me is appellate courts, both at the state and the federal level, continue to say, eh, jury verdicts in civil cases, no, no, no. They don't know what they're doing. We need to take those away. But jury verdicts in criminal cases, especially where people are convicted, we don't want to touch those. Doctrines. So there may be error. But it's harmless error. I, it just, I, I'm tired of it, man. Can you, can you rationalize this for me in some way, shape, or form, Pat? <laughs> no. Um, look, the, um, what ought to bother people is the state of the law here is that it is clearly better to be a corporation yeah. or um, a civil defendant than it is to be anyone facing either the death penalty or lengthy imprisonment. Um, that has been the case for the last two decades. Uh, you keep hoping that at some point the um, appellate courts will recognize that they have been shooting the wounded for a very long time, uh, but that is not happening in any way, shape, or form that I've seen. The only good signs on this are that, um, for instance, um, where a court has made a wonderful record, um, as they did in the Harris County bond case, the appellate court has not stayed the enforcement of it mm -hmm. um, in the Fifth Circuit. Um, same circuit has just released this. Yeah. Um, and Judge um, Rosenthal, who prepared a, honestly, an old school inspiring opinion, um, replete with facts. Uh, based on the somewhat embarrassing testimony of our Harris County um, County Judiciary about how they practice um, bail oppression every day. And um, she ruled in the plaintiff's favor, and the Fifth Circuit uh, did not stay that enforcement. So mm -hmm. now we have people actually being released on minor, ridiculous charges often, um, instead of being forced into a situation where they have to plea, which has been the norm for the last 20 years. The thing that troubles me about this case, and this is the Alvarez case that, versus City of Brownsville, this guy pled guilty to assault of a public servant. It later comes out that they, they hid exculpatory evidence, which actually exonerated him of the assault. 
okay? They, they bring this up and he's found, he is, he is determined to be actually innocent by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. I mean, the highest criminal court in Texas finds this guy actually innocent, which that doesn't happen very often. Uh, they do it in this case. He files a, a, a civil lawsuit. The district court, the federal district court, finds that the, his, civil, his constitutional rights were violated under Section 1983. He wins $2 million. And then this court, the Fifth Circuit, says, no, because he pled, he's not actually entitled to that. I mean, the, 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 the rationale, I just couldn't wrap my head around it in this case. I just couldn't. I, I don't think you're going to. Um, and hopefully they will uh, petition for either um, review of that or um, attempt to sit there and work a change in the legislation or uh, the law that would assist people with these claims. But the Fifth Circuit has been extremely harsh on many civil rights claims. Um, it's fairly rare that one gets upheld, um, and it's even more rare that a significant jury verdict gets upheld. So it's, that's simply the state of the law. I wish it was different, um, but as you can see, welcome to Texas. <laughs> Megan, what do you think? Do you think uh, somebody who's uh, eventually declared actually innocent, serves years in prison, uh, deserves to be compensated, they pled guilty. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, and that's what it's always gonna come back to. You signed it on the paper that says, I say I'm guilty, and even if there's completely exculpatory evidence, apparently there are some people on the bench who will go back and say, we know that there might be various reasons that people might plead guilty, such as to get out of jail because they couldn't bail out or whatever the case may be. Or coerced confessions. But because you, yeah, <laughs> but because you put it on the paper, apparently it doesn't matter. I mean, does this open, what if the, if the, the Alvarez was able to keep the $2 million and the, the Fifth Circuit said, you know what, you can file uh, a 1983 civil rights action uh, via Brady violations and you're entitled to this money because you were sent to prison on something that you were actually found innocent on. Uh, wouldn't that open cities to lawsuits from all sorts of, from all sorts of individuals who uh, later on would claim that their Brady rights were violated? And if so, I mean, d does the city deserve it? it? It wouldn't. The city does deserve it. And more importantly, the problem with this floodgates of litigation phantom that um, people keep talking about is that the costs of getting into federal court are prohibitive. And the number of civil rights attorneys in this area is infinitesimal mm -hmm. compared to um, how many cases of actual abuse are out there. Look, we've had um, hundreds of shootings in Houston for which no police officer has ever been held responsible. Right. And just on simple odds, that's not going to be correct. Um, the reality is that um, if people knew how hard it is to get in, survive summary judgment, which is the first hurdle, um, state a claim, prove damages, um, they would not be worried about this. It is a fear that exists only in the minds of appellate justices. Yeah, and it, like you said, it's so hard to get past the summary judgment stage. That This is a district judge down in the valley, a federal district judge who said, look, I, I, I'm saying, I'm ruling that this guy's, this man's constitutional rights were violated. It then, get, then goes to a jury for a damages award, and they determine that $2 million is the appropriate number. And, and, and it's just like this, this whole thing keeps replaying every time we see a case go up before uh, a, a, an appellate court, is that when there is a large jury verdict, they say, mm -mm, no, no, we can't let that stand, and we're gonna, we're gonna find some way like they did in this case because he pled, therefore it vitiates the whole thing. They, they do it all the time, and, and the exact opposite is true when you have a criminal conviction. They, they, they figure out a way to write around it and maintain the jury's verdict. Like, how, how can it be that every single time juries are wrong in civil cases, but they get it right 100% of the time in criminal cases? That just makes no sense to me. And it won't. Um, and not to um, 
take this away, but you know, it's funny when you said chorus confessions. Every time a citizen gets into the Harris County Jail and they stay more than 30 days because they can't make a bond, because the bonds are too much money for an average working person to come up with. And, I, and for those of you at home, if you can somehow find $1,000 uh, in cash handy, um, God bless you, because that makes you part of the minority that can actually afford a bond. Um, but every time that that person stays more than 30 days, they've lost their residence because they're either tossed out of the apartment, they've lost their job, oftentimes their families are going to be tossed out, um, so their family is homeless, um, and literally a misdemeanor destroys people's lives when they can't get out of jail and fight the case. So they plea eventually to a time served or some other extortion form of probation fees um, in order to sit there and have their life back. That's the simple truth, and that's what Judge Rosenthal recognized. Um, and, and I suspect that's what happened to Alvarez in this case, which is why he pleaded guilty in the first place. And, you know, his, his, they hid evidence from him. Uh, what other choices is he going to have, you know? Well, and I, I think the facts in this particular, particular case were extraordinarily uh, problematic because I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Brownsville... Police department actively engaged in tampering mm -hmm. and hiding and manipulating evidence so that this individual uh, wouldn't find out about such right. misconduct. And you got to ask, I, 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 I kind of felt like the argument in the opinion was circular because it said, well, uh, he pled guilty so he doesn't get the money. Well, he wouldn't have pled guilty if he had known that all these cops were hiding and tampering with evidence. But he still pled guilty and waived all his rights. Yeah. Well, he pled guilty and waived his rights because he, trial, he would have gotten killed if he had not known uh, that these officers were doing the wrong thing. Yeah, but he pled guilty and waived his rights. Yeah. And so I just felt like I was going in this merry-go-round with yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, you just keep coming back to that. I mean, I, it's frustrating because, you know, we sit here and we read these opinions all the time. It just, it's, it's. It's like a broken record to me. And you, and you know, recently, it just, it, it's all this air of, or this, this feeling of uh, protection on government protections and yeah. the government getting bigger. Just recently, I think the Supreme Court's going to consider whether or not a border patrol agent can pick off Mexicans from across the, across the river, shoot them, and then whether or not immunity is going to apply to the, uh, to the border patrol agent when this individual who he just murdered decides to sue him. Uh, and at this point, the government's, uh, or at least the state of the law, is that, well, he's uh, Border Patrol, he enjoys some sort of immunity or some sort of protections, and therefore, if he shoots these individuals across the border, uh, then uh, in his official capacity, he should be okay or, or absolved from any sort of liability. That's crazy. I didn't see that. Yeah, it's coming out, man. Really? Yeah. Where did you see that? It's uh, NPR. Wow. Oh. NPR. Every morning. NPR. It's great. <laughs> it's great. It's great. <laughs> Let's talk about this. You have the lead this week. And it may or may not show up. Let's see. Hey. Oh, look. No, this is awesome. Check it out. You have it, too. Yeah. No, we can see. This is Sheriff Garcia <laughs> walking through it's the city. It's not working very well yet, Marshmallow right? Marshmallow uh, State Puff Man. No? Uh, look. He's... he's, he's <laughs> This is the one time that the sheriff on our show is actually walking through the city. Right. How cool is that? <laughs> this is live, ladies and gentlemen. Playing games, man. <laughs> it's uh, a great story, though. It's so an Ma honor. Megan, you have the cover story this week in the Houston Press. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, this, of course, you know, Pat, Pat's been talking about it here, um, the bail bond lawsuit. You've been, you've been on this thing from the get-go. You've attended all the hearings. Um, tell us your impressions from sitting in the courtroom as a non-lawyer and as a re reporter? Um, I would say that most of it, I was trying to figure out what exactly the county was fighting mm -hmm. because they go out there and their lawyers say, we of course don't want poor people in jail. Of course, like nobody wants that. That's not disputed. Um, but then they would make arguments such as, well, there's only like one to three poor people in jail. It's not a problem here. And it's, it just seemed to be ignorant of the, the history and 
how long this has been a problem. I mean, this lawsuit didn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and so some of those arguments were just so out there that it was hard to reconcile all of the reforms that they were touting with this staunch defense of the money bail system as it exists in Harris County. Um, and so that was the really the most interesting thing to watch. What do you think was the most eye-opening testimony that you heard sitting through most of the proceedings? Let's see. Um, Judge Jordan really did give uh, some very poignant testimony because you have all of the rest of the 15 judges saying we can't do this like this is compromising public safety um, you know we we need to have for high-risk people um, dangerous people we can't let them out then you have Judge Jordan saying I do this with every single misdemeanor defendant I don't have a massive problem you know I there might be some people who fail to appear and I was sitting in his court one time when there was one of those people, all he had him do was explain, you know, why'd you let me down? Why didn't you come back? And after an explanation, he said, okay, I understand. I'll give you another PR bond as long as you promise that you won't do it again. Um, and so there was this much different approach that he laid out. Um, and that seemed to really resonate with Judge Rosenthal because she was seeing that it is possible to have a system where you aren't holding loads of misdemeanor defendants unnecessarily. And now, Judge Jordan is the only, well, he's not the only one anymore. Up until this week, he was the only judge that was um, trying to settle it, but also the only judge that was using the county attorney for his representation. Judge Fields also. Ju judge went. Fields joined just, that this yeah. week. Does he settled? He wants to settle? Well, he hasn't come out and said he wants to settle, but he has said that he is. he does not want the county spending any more money on private lawyers in his representation and is electing to use the county attorney's office to represent him going forward. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Still no, no change in the position. No, no change in the position. Except for the fact that he's recognizing we are spending more than $3.5 million yeah. here. That's exceeding the MacArthur grant at this point. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I, the, the numbers just aren't making any sense yeah. whatsoever. I'll give you a number that doesn't make sense. The county's paying $500 an hour plus um, to the boutique firm that they hired to defend this, federal death penalty lawyers make 182. The average wage for the lawyers in most of the county courts typically comes to about 75 an hour, if that. Um, and the district courts are not much better. Mm -mm. Uh, so the, um, the county has made its priorities very clear about what it wants to do. Um, and what it wants to do is continue to run that massive mill um, of pleas as quickly and efficiently as possible. And it does no service to any of the citizens by doing that. Well, and almost is what could be seen as kind of a backlash to this ruling, the, the district courts have now issued a new bond schedule. Uh, I didn't hear about that. Oh, yeah. that's a lovely piece of a thumb in the eye of the or federal judiciary. Case. Yes, yeah. that's just really nice. Um, they increased every single bond, um, and in some cases for um, crimes, uh, making it uh, double or triple what it was. And so either this is an attempt to appear tough before what may be a difficult election, or it's a thumb in the eye of the federal judiciary because the district courts have the exact same problem. The vast majority of district court cases are crack. Yeah, nonviolent, nonviolent drug offenses. Now they have they have a more serious issue in the fact that they do have people who are on um, serious and violent offenses. Um, but, many but, of those people are mentally ill. People, but you say that serious and violent offenses. But a lot of the people that they they end up with these huge exposure on punishment cases is because they're repeat offenders in the system. You know, it's it's because they're being enhanced, and you always hear this. They're they're getting me. I mean, every lawyer has heard this. They're punishing me because of my past. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing, and that's what's driving up not only the, the, the bond in these cases, because you right. know, they look at it upon, some judges look at it upon what's the punishment you're exposed to. Um, in, in addition to, in some of these drug cases, the, the, the bond is based upon the quantity of the drugs, you know? That's one thing I think they did actually change. Um... I think they had stopped doing it, oh, based on how much how many drugs you have, we're going to double it from there, however it was done before, right. and now I think they just raised it, I want to say it's 150 flat 
Yeah, well, and that's, and that's <laughs> ridiculous. I mean, you're not going to, most of these guys aren't going to make that. Yeah. No one's going to make it. The no. average income in this country is $54,000 a year. That's the mm -hmm. median income, and technically median is not average, but the average income is not much less. Um, so for a uh, middle class person, um, nurse, teacher, cop, firefighter, um, a uh, guy working in the oil fields, uh, you are making an annual salary that is now the equivalent or one half, in some cases less than one half, or more than one half, of the um, amount that the county wants you to pay in a bond to be able to fight your case, and that is obscene. It's obscene mm -hmm. in so many different ways. There is no person that could, on average, come up with the amount of money required to sit and get out of jail based upon those surety amounts. So if the judges follow that, then they are condemning several thousand people who are not charged with violent offenses and who are not a flight risk and who are not a danger to the community they are condemning those people to stay until the year from now that they will get their trial. Yeah, and, and I'm working to try and, and get some people from the bonding companies on here. I've had some contact with them. We're trying to get them on the show because I, obviously I, I would like to hear the bondsman's perspective on this. Um, we got to open up the phone lines for them. Well, yeah, early. I mean, and, and look, I, I mean, I guess I'm trying to figure out, and I understand there's a, there's a, there is a sweet spot for them where they make a lot of money on this deal. Because look, the reality is, the people who are the poor, the poor people who cannot afford any bond whatsoever, that's not their that's not their marketplace, because those people are never going to be able to afford a bond, okay? And that's at the misdemeanor level. So on the felony level, I mean, now this this new bail schedule, I don't see how. I mean, on a 150 bond, that means you're going to have to come up with what, fifteen thousand dollars for a bondsman fee, and a hundred plus grand in surety. Right. Give me a break. I mean, there, there there's not <laughs> going to be very many. That that's a very limited marketplace for the bondsman to participate in. And some bondsmen, you know, they might not be willing to to even if you do have that kind of surety on you. If you're a high risk individual facing 25 to life, <coughs> I mean, th Maybe. they might look at that and say, "Man, eh, we got our own risk." Issues here that we might not be willing to do. Maybe it was all those fifteen hundred, two thousand, five hundred dollar bonds that they're not. I now uh, they won't get, and I think maybe that's their rub. I'm not sure. I, I doubt that. Um, well, I I don't know. Um, I don't know if the bondsman had any input into this new schedule. I know this was the seriously worst case of timing and arrogance. Um, that I've ever seen from this judiciary, and I have seen a lot of that over the last couple of decades. Megan, did any of the bondsmen testify at the federal <laughs> hearings, I, um, injunction hearing? I did talk to a bondsman for this story, and I had said, he kind of started off by saying, right. well, I didn't get my chance to testify in court, so I'm glad you called, kind of a thing. Apparently, Judge Rosenthal wouldn't allow them to file briefs or testify, um, and I can't speak to the reasoning to that, but they did not get a chance to testify. And I don't know if they filed an amicus brief or anything at the Fifth Circuit when the, when the stay. Well, several states have now joined That's right. uh, Texas and are filing amicus briefs in support of um, Harris County, and mm -hmm. Texas is also um, taking that up. Um, but that, again, is not a, uh, a bellwether of whether they're in the right. Yeah, I mean, some of the arguments I've heard, and there was a big, there was a an editorial, I think, piece in the Austin American Statesman that one of the bondsmen up there wrote in response to, a, I think, a proposed bill that had gone to the House there on bail reform. And, you know, they were, they were saying that they provide a service uh, of monitoring defendants mm -hmm. and, and, and being able to, you know, provide the security to ensure that these people are coming to court and doing their things and reporting on time and uh, that, they, that they provide a quasi uh, pretrial services. Um, they do. This is my favorite but, argument, but, but, actually. But we also have pretrial services. They do, and, and but on, on the reality, yeah. uh, and I, mm -hmm. and I, I want to give you a chance to, they, they do because they're afraid of losing money. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, so there's an incentive for them to be on top of these people, but the, the problem is that as soon as they detect a risk, rather than take a corrective action, they surrender the bond, right. and then the person is back in, in jail or in custody, or 
has to come up with yet another bond by some other bondsman. So, and I don't know if you're going to hit that, but. So this is what it comes down to really. And it is, you know, I, I, talked, I talked to Chuck Cooper and was basically asking, why is a secured money bond bail or bail bond more effective than an unsecured bail bond? Um, they both carry the same financial consequence if you don't show up. You're still on the line for the full bail amount if you don't come to court, which is the whole point of bail. Mm -hmm. um, but then they'll say, well, you know, with a surety, you have the bail bondsman, and also if somebody pays the surety for them, then the friends and family will be on that person to try to make them come to court. And you say, well, what about Harris County Pretrial Services? They actually like do that for a living. Um, it's a whole department devoted to that. And it's, well, they're just better at it. But there's really nothing to support that. Sure. Um, I think the, there was a study done in Colorado um, looking at 10 different county jails and you know comparing the FTA rates for secured versus unsecured, very comparable. Um, public safety, very comparable. Um, so there wasn't really a way to say secured bail is better than unsecured bail. There's just not really a way to prove that. What kicked, historically, um, did, in the article you mentioned about a, a period of time where uh, the whole uh, big bond, keep them in jail, misdemeanor uh, 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 happened. Around what time was that? And were you practicing at that time, Pat? Well, I'll have to hear when she says, as long as it was in the last so, century, probably. So, okay, we, have, we have sort of a, a few decades here where a lot of things took place. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Alberti case that really brought on, um, it was a big impetus to get more pretrial services, personal bonds, um, because of the jail overcrowding problem. So those, you know, the 1980s, they start picking up. They really hit their peak in the early 90s, particularly in 1994. Um, and then that year, a whole bunch of stuff happened. You had a woman get murdered by a man who was out on a personal bond. Um, he was severely mentally disabled, but you know those, he was on a personal bond, and that became the bail bondsman's argument against personal bonds for the public safety reason. Um, you saw them going to the legislature to try to get legislation passed to require judges to put their names um, on, you know, they would have a whole list of personal bonds and which judge signed it. So basically, they would be held accountable if that person committed a crime. Um, and then you had the bail bondsmen sue pretrial services, claiming that they were falsifying information to make themselves appear, appear better at supervising defendants than bail bondsmen are. Again, back to the who's better at it. Yeah. Um, and so then you just saw personal bonds. Just after 1994, they just never stopped plummeting. And that was it. All that kind of... I'll like, point out another thing that... Um, mm -hmm. Megan was diplomatic enough not to mention Republican sweep in 94 yes. um, wiped out um, the Democratic judges and the Republicans have held control up until 2008 um, and this last election and to be candid um, the death of personal bonds started immediately after that those were it was the same it was the same time period it was yeah, in 1995 those, yeah like a lovely confluence of bad things uh, mm -hmm. coming together in one big river of crap well, so it's um, interesting you say that because one of the new arguments that I'm hearing coming out, and it's it's mostly from the further right Republicans, <laughs> let's say, is that all this is leading to is you know well, it's just going to lead to more court-appointed lawyers. The state that you know people this is this is the last bastion of entitlements that the system can give you. That that now everybody's going to get a free bond. And they're going to want a free lawyer too, um, and so that that's the argument that the conservatives are coming up with as to, to help try and keep the bond, the money bond system in place, is that this is, this is entitlements coming at you. And this is the last wave of it. We've done, they've done everything else to give you entitlements. They've given you this, they've given you that. Uh, and now this is the last bastion. The criminal justice system is the last bastion of entitlements. And, and you know, now it's free bonds, and next thing it's going to be everybody gets a free lawyer. Well, that's just bad math. Uh, <laughs> and, and here's why that's bad math. The cost of keeping people in the jail for, let's say, the typical 90-day spiel before they actually get to a, to a plea setting um, is enormous because the county's actually feeding this person, okay? And they're not paying taxes, and I guarantee you that as soon as they're out um, of that, they are less employable, they are out of work for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever sales tax revenue you were getting off that individual, gone. 
Um, so you have a loss of his revenue and you have a cost for feeding and housing him. And if that person has a mental illness, they are incredibly expensive. Harris County normally maintains at least 3,000 or more people mm -hmm. on psychotropic medications every damn day. Every day when you walk in there, you will find at least 3,000 prescriptions being filled out. A couple of hundred people are in the severely disturbed wings of the psych wards, and a small group of unmanageable people are at um, Harris County Psychiatric Center, uh, where we have a handful of beds for the ultimate in unmanageable people that are severely ill. If you are going to sit there and say that somehow um, letting them out is going to cost money, um, I would suggest that that person failed fifth grade math and shouldn't be listened to. You know, on the, since, the last, since the last few weeks, from going from a holdover on the misdemeanor side where uh, it would be packed to the walls. I mean, you're talking people sitting on the ledges. I mean, I mean it is packed to literally uh, for uh, a court appointment these days, we're getting, I'm getting one or two jails top. So where you'd get five daily. For the last, since, is it, since at least what has been implemented here now, maybe you get one, maybe you get two jails. And in fact, there's only like five people in the holdover. But has your court appointment list overall increased? Because that's no. the argument that, that, that no. these doomsdayers it's, are using, is it, that you know, the wave of entitlements is coming. There are, uh, there are court of individuals, lawyers who are appointed by the court for the day who aren't even getting work now. So let's say we get five lawyers in a court. Two of them, or three of them, maybe two, maybe not three, get nothing. And uh, you get one, and each of those three will get one or two. And, but the county is still paying for all five. It is a completely inefficient um, system. I'm not getting more court appointments. In fact, I'm getting less court appointments. And, and granted, that'll bring your caseload down. Uh, but the idea that, oh, now they get the free bond, and now they're out, and they're going to want the free lawyer. Uh, and I just haven't seen that yeah. recently. We're, we're, uh, we reached the halfway point of the program, ladies and gentlemen. So if you want to call in, 713-807-1794 is the number. Still got Twitter up. It's kind of quiet. So... Get your questions and comments here. Join in on the conversation. Can I throw out a challenge? You can throw out a challenge. Lay it down, Pat. Any judge who is watching this, please call in and actually have the guts to stand and debate why PR bonds, personal recognizance bonds, are a bad thing. Call in. I know you call watch. In. I know you watch. Lay it down. Um, so, uh, I mean, you're not getting the appointments on, on the wheel. Which is cool, which is fine. I mean, you know, I mean, you just, yeah. you, you are, but you, you're getting maybe one or two. But, it, but and I don't know, I, I haven't heard this argument, but per, perhaps their argument is an expansion of the public defender's office. I don't know. Well, they are getting a small expansion, I believe. Right, they are the for, at bail hearings. correct. They are doing that, and that starts in this coming July, month, yeah. July. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like july -ish. But that, <laughs> But that's another issue. You, yeah. most of the stuff that when people talk about increased cost, um, they're always, strangely happy to shunt aside the cost of the jail. Mm -hmm. Keeping people in jail, the suits that happen in jail, the overtime mm -hmm. um, and the extra staff that are needed in jail, the injuries that happen to the jailers yeah. from overcrowding. That was okay. a big argument is that, you know, Kelvin Banks even went up there and said that pretrial services doesn't have the budget for this. And there's some truth to that. I mean, they're gonna be getting significantly more personal bonds. Um, but Judge Rosenthal was saying it's not true to the extent that the county was trying to make it so because of the fact that there's no, there was no consideration for the savings that would come from not holding all of these people in jail. So that was a big argument. And I case. think it, it's, it's good sense. For instance, uh, I'll give you an example. In a neighboring county, um, when uh, that county instituted um, a uh, well-done mental um, health defender system, the number of mentally ill people and their stay went dramatically down for minor crimes. And these are folks who oftentimes make up the bulk sure. of the misdemeanor cases. You have people who are homeless and mentally ill and they get picked up for criminal trespass or criminal mischief or um, a minor drug possession or public intoxication um, or some other assault offense that comes out of their being ill and drunk. Um, and those folks get 
hopefully now also under some of the new programs here in Harris, they get diverted. But in Fort Bend, they cut their stay by an average of about 60 days. Um, mm. And that means no medication cost, no extra shifts. It dramatically reduces the cost of the jail. And it makes the jailers safer when you have fewer people to watch. So if you really want to sit there and claim that you're out there for law enforcement, then figure out how to make the jails less crowded. And that will help. Instead of building new super jails, <laughs> and all the money, hey, the, you know, it's been the solution forever. Well, well, build now build more jails, build more, jail, build, build build more cots. processing center. Right, that's what I'm saying. And I, I just have this doomsday vision of the, the inmate processing center. I'm like this huge revolving door of just people coming in and out and in and out. Uh, it's just, and now we're going to have the public defender's office uh, led by a, a, a warrior, a champion for Justin himself, Alex Bunnan, uh, putting people on the ground. And I hope that uh, hope it makes an impact. I'm sure it will. Um, you going to cover that story? Absolutely. That's awesome. How, how did yeah. you, how, I mean, you, you've been, I mean, as far as I know, I've been reading your stuff, I think, since you got with the press. I mean, you kind of have gravitated towards the criminal justice aspect. Yeah, you of know. our city. The week that I moved to Houston, Sandra Bland had just died in jail. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a huge story that week. And, um, part of it had to do with bail. A huge part of it had to do with bail. And that really was where my interest in that problem initiated was, you know, yes, the, enti the entire, you know, the, the arrest, the way she was treated and assaulted by this officer, then how she was put in jail and three days later, you know, she has a $500 bail that she can't make and she commits suicide or so the authorities say. Um, and, you know, all of that goes back to the fact that if she didn't have, I mean, she wasn't arrested in the first place, but if, if she was released on a personal bond for a completely insignificant offense that they accused her of, none of that would have happened. <laughs> and so that was really where it started. And talking to more defense attorneys in Harris County, I realized that it had been a massive problem here for decades. <laughs> and so that's, that's really where my interest in it initiated. You've done some great work on it. We got a, we got a phone call. I want to get in here. Hello. Thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hello. Oh. Hello. Yeah, um, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to ask uh, the panel how much longer the, uh, uh, the county commissioners are going to resist the inevitable. Uh, I think that I think the fee is up to like uh, you know by my calculation, uh, ten million dollars by the time you get you know all of the depositions and and it goes to trial, and that's one question. And another question for Megan is. Uh, why hasn't uh, the Houston Press published a list of, and this may be public, I think it should be public, I think it is, published a list of the contributions by the bond industry to the judges that, uh, uh, which, I mean, this, this whole thing is real dirty if we find out that over half the money in the till for the judges has come from the bond industry. Well, thank you. I'll take my Thanks answer. for your questions. Appreciate it. You want to attack it first? Um, I did actually take a look at the county judges, their contributions from bail bondsmen quite extensively. Um, I was considering making that a portion of the article if I found it to be uh, particularly compelling. Um, but the, the donations from bail bondsmen to the campaigns were not actually as substantial as I was expecting them to be. Um, I think that's a bigger issue with the district court judges, and I don't want to overstate anything because it's been a while since I've um, looked into that extensively. Um, but that was the reason that I didn't include that in the story is because I didn't want to make something out of nothing when um, the campaign contributions were not over the top by any means. From, from a litigation standpoint, we're at three million, three, four million. Uh, what would be the next steps? So uh, would it go kick back to the district court level so we can get the trial started? Yeah, that's where we're at. We, we've, we've still got to go through. I mean, this was just an injunction hearing right. that we've spent three and a half million dollars on. They've now applied for a, a stay with the Fifth Circuit. That failed. They took it up to the Supreme Court. That failed. So now we come back down and we're stuck in the, we're going to get a DACA control order to enter. We're going to mm -hmm. proceed along with discovery. Uh, they're going to have their initial scheduling conference, and the judge is going to say, okay, you have to have 
all your discovery complete by this date, you know, dispositive motions will be due by this date, and I'm setting, setting you on the trial docket for, you know, maybe a year from now uh, on the two-week trial docket starting whatever date next summer. That's phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Depositions of what? All the judges. Well, yeah. You, you, all, and then everybody else involved, 100 people. I mean, look, if you're Sussman Godfrey, right, you're going to want to depose all 16 county court judges. You're going to want to depose them all, okay? And if they win this case, which is, I mean, look, they're 3-0 and right now. <laughs> I mean, they're up 3 nothing, and, and, and unlike your uh, finals picking skills, I mean, at this point, you have to think, is, this might be a clean sweep for them, right? And so if Sussman Godfrey goes all the way through, it takes at least the 16 depositions of the judges. They might take all the commissioner's depositions. So that's another five, six right there. Mm -hmm. So now we're up to 21, 22. Uh, there's probably going to be, I, I, would, I would not be surprised if you really develop this case from a discovery standpoint, just on the depositions, you're going to have 30 depositions. Minimum. I mean, I'd be amazed if they took this to trial, um, but with how vigorously they've been fighting so far, maybe then again, I, I wouldn't be surprised. So I, I can't really decide how I expect that to go, especially given Judge Rosenthal's ruling. Yeah, I just um, don't know. It, it seemed to be the final word to me. I, I don't know how you could Who gets back. to settle? Who gets to, is it the commissioner's mm -hmm. court that says we're settling this? Is it, is it the well, county attorney? Well, that's, says, the, that's the funny thing. So, I mean, technically, who has the authority to settle? Is it the county commissioners? Is it the judges? Since they've been named, I mean, clearly Judge George is trying to settle and he's been precluded from doing so. I wonder if you he know? ends up suing for a 1983 action and getting money from it if the <laughs> government will take his money away too. I don't, I don't know. But who does? Who has the authority so to settle? So I asked this question once, particularly when Judge Jordan had, you know, sent that brief letter saying, I would like to settle. Like, can he do that? Can just this individual person settle? Um, and the county attorney's office explained it like, no, all of the parties have to be on the same page. Um, Good luck with And then that. essentially, the way it seemed to work at commissioner's court, um, they had put forth, it was really tricky how they did this. They, they started by saying, we want to settle this case. And everyone was like, wow, like, I, you know, they're going to settle. This is a big, this is big news. Um, as part of the settlement agreement, it was the authority to move forward by appealing the case. Um, uh -huh. It was very confusing the way it was worded, um, but it was if, you know, we don't have satisfactory terms here, uh, we should be allowed to fight certain portions of yeah. the ruling. I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, is, is this going to be an issue that in 2018 really affects uh, some of the local elections here? I mean, on the judiciary side? I hope it does. Uh, I have rarely seen uh, any action uh, that has been so uncaring for um, the citizenry of this county. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's mind-boggling to sit there and think that you've got a series of judges who, without any data, are, and in fact against the large amount of data that has been analyzed, are trying to stick to a position that is not only cruel um, and inhumane, but um, impractical and expensive. And, and yet they continue down this path, sort of, I, I suppose, like legal lemmings, you know, running for the edge. Um, and if, if they don't stop this, I, I genuinely hope that um, the voters send them a message um, regarding this, because if I were someone whose loved one was in jail unnecessarily simply because I had to pay, I had to choose between paying the rent and the gas bill to keep the kids warm or getting my loved one out of jail, I would be angry. And I, but are those probably going to be, but are those people going to be angry enough to show up and vote in 2018? That that's my question: is that historically. Mm -hmm. Non-presidential years, our voter turnout in this county is really, really low. Okay, now, now, granted, it's a gubernatorial election, but I think most people feel like Texas is a Republican state. I'm not going to have much impact if I'm a Democratic voter uh, on on you know the main elections, governor, lieutenant governor, that sort of thing. So my question is, do these people actually show up and vote? 
I don't know. Uh, I can only tell you that um, in this last election, um, Harris County did not go uh, the way people thought it was going to go. That's right. Fort Bend County um, actually went to Hillary um, yeah. and, in, and came within a percentage point on most of the judicial races. Uh, and honestly, I don't know that if you're a Republican and you actually think about what you're doing, whether you're a um, person who comes at it from a, um, a position of faith and trying to be uh, more just and merciful, whether you're coming at it from a point of view of actually looking at the numbers and realizing that this system makes no sense numbers-wise. It's more costly, it's less efficient, it takes people out of work, it takes people away from their families, and takes people out of the tax base. Or if you're coming at it from a Republican perspective of libertarianism and actually caring about civil liberties, for every one of those reasons, those voters are to come out and sit there and send a message to um, the Republican folks that have done this that this is not an acceptable practice. Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing, you know, the mantra used to be tough on crime, okay? That, that's what all of these people used to run on was tough on crime. But I, I, I think that there is a split in the Republican Party, at least as I see it, is that you, have, you still have those that are hanging on to the tough on crime mantra, but you have this, this kind of new philosophy of smart on crime. And, and not to be doing things like this, because, because I think they've realized, at least this, this faction, so to speak, that what you've done is, is you created a bloated government by doing this. And historically, the Republican Party has been the party that doesn't want big government, right? And I think that by being tough on crime, they've, they've created a bigger government by virtue of the prison industry, the jails, all this stuff. You know, and, and so I think some of them are starting to see like, hey, whoa, this, this kind of goes against our principles. Here. Well, the, the argument that keeps popping up is, well, we got to keep the community safe. We got to do it. Mm -hmm. And you, I respond to them and I say, these are misdemeanors. These are trespasses, driving while license invalids, um, mischiefs, a little bit of lewdness. And you say, oh, well, if they get the PR bond and commit a crime, the, you know, the, the government has to protect the people. Mm -hmm. And I say, look, and so and I, I, I respond and I say, look, those guys would, would have gotten a time served in the old system anyways and would have been back on the street th that same day yeah. or even maybe even faster than you can PR bond them out. That's how fast these guys were coming in, pleading guilty and getting out. So the idea that this individual would still be in jail if we didn't give him a PR bond or the community would be safer, it makes mm -hmm. no sense. Yeah, and then it boils down to, okay, so then the alternative is to set their bond, make them pay a few hundred bucks, and then they get back out anyway. Or if they're poor, then again, it comes back to the equal protection problem, where like, okay, well this equally risky person can just pay and get out, and apparently if he's so risky, you know, why are we letting him out, but preventative attention is legal, then you have the poor person who can't get out, and it's a misdemeanor, and they're just gonna sit there. Um, so I understand the judges, it really boils down to them, the people who get re-arrested, especially if they're out on bond, they cannot stand having to re-release that person on a personal bond. That's their main beef, um, and they, you know, they see it as a non-accountability. Non um, but then it just goes back to, well, why is making them pay 200 bucks and a $2,000 bond better? Does, does, why is it better? The idea, does the ability uh, of one to pay two to three hundred dollars make them less risky? And that was the sheriff's whole argument. Absolutely not. Right. I don't <laughs> and think that's it why does. the sheriff supports it, is because the sheriff says money doesn't make people safer. And it, it doesn't. There's no research out there that would support that in any way. Well, here's, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Here, here's another um, thing. When you have the district attorney, the sheriff, a small splinter group of the judges all saying that they support this. These are the folks who actually house and prosecute mm -hmm. the folks. The judges don't do that. The judge's responsibility is not to be punishing people with a bond. The judge's responsibility is to ensure that people who come into the system are treated fairly. 
That's it. And I think that's right. what they don't. Uh, I think the hard part that people understand is that, that bail is not supposed to be used. I mean, the case law is clear. It's not supposed to be used as an oppression tool. It's it's solely meant to ensure that the defendant appears in court. And and for the overwhelming majority of people in this country, a thousand dollar bond or a twenty five hundred dollar bond is just an exorbitant amount of money. It really is. I mean, it, it, you're talking. To, for someone who makes twenty-five thousand dollars a year, a twenty-five hundred bond dollar bond is ten percent of their income. Ten percent, you know, and and, and it takes ten percent just to pay the bondman fee, you know. I, I mean, it's. It, I did have. Um, it's just crazy. So I mean, they, they, I don't think they're looking at it in through a normal lens. I agree. What are you going to say? Well, I, I was just going to say, if, if you look at demographics for what the average income is, what the average disposable income is, what the weekly salaries are in this county, the bond schedules had never been matched to the people who live here. Mm -hmm. You want to sit there and make a reasonable bond, then actually gather some data rather than pulling numbers out of, since this is a, a certain family place. show, I'll say the air. But um, rather than simply trying to make an impression that you are somehow um, tough, why not actually think about what you're doing and try and match it up to data and try and match it up to the facts on the ground and realize that most people are working people that cannot afford the bonds that we have now and they rot in jail because they can't pay them. And that's the simple truth of that suit. Well, you know, they're, what we keep hearing is they're criminals. They're, these, these offenders are out on PR bonds. These criminals uh, are out on a PR bond. You know, I, I, I'm a defense lawyer, and I'll be the first person to tell you that, look, I, I don't believe everybody who's accused of a crime is innocent. I don't. But at the same time, I believe in the presumption of that innocence. And that unless and until that individual is proven guilt, or pleas, proves their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, this person is entitled to this presumption and God forbid that we treat everybody as though they were presumed to be innocent in our system. And if, and <laughs> if, if we started from that approach, I think this whole, this whole thing wouldn't be, wouldn't be happening. I don't know. It's just baffling. I, I can't, oh, these offenders and these, these, these criminals. No, no. They're like your brother. They're like your sister. They're like my mom. They're like your cousin. They're caught up in something, and whether they're guilty or not, we'll never really know. Who knows? But until, unless and until they're proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, they're entitled to at least be treated like decent human beings. Well, and I think, I, I think too, the process gets screwed up because, I mean, it's the state's burden to prove the case. Right. The state's burden becomes a lot easier when you oppress people keep them in jail, and they're willing to roll over and not fight their case. I mean, and that's bad for everybody, in my opinion, because, you know, if, if more people are not willing to fight the state's proof, then that means they're just going to keep trying to go after more and more people, you and know? They're absolutely on, not going to want to fight it if they're bad sitting cases. in jail. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it starts to make the state's, state's job a little easier. It has uh, made the state's job to, to, there's, yeah. there's zero doubt that this has made the state's job easier. But I mean, I, I'm talking about on a, on a macro level, too. On a macro it, level, it's made every, every county yeah. in this state, okay, has an easier time of it when the defendant is in jail. That's the right. simple truth. You can't get witnesses. You can't um, get funds together uh, to sit there and support your legal defense. You can't work um, to pay your lawyer. Um, and if you're trying to fight a case, I can guarantee you that if you, if you are able to make a bond and go out, you have a far better chance of beating it than if you are sitting in a cell for 60 or 90 days before you can even get to a dispositive hearing or an actual trial. Yeah. Um, and that is what the current norm is. In fact, that's probably a low ball estimate for misdemeanors. Right. It's certainly much longer if you're sitting in district court waiting a trial on a possession of a controlled substance um, or a, you know, uh, some other felony. It's just not feasible for people to sit there and 
try to fight their case from inside a cell. Well, and you know, there's always that article that floats around uh, now on, on social media, but there, there, it, it always floats around every, every couple months about if everybody would just set their case for trial, what would happen? How the whole case, how the whole system would implode in upon itself. And, and realistically, I mean, it, it's not going to happen because it's... It, it, People are going to plea. That's right. It, it can't, I mean, it's, it's, not only is it a theory, it's a fantasy, because people are gonna plead out solely to get out. I mean, it's just, it, it's just like whenever there's a, a union strike, uh, somebody always crosses the picket line because they need the money, you know? And in this case, they need to get out to make money, to support their families, and they're gonna take the path of least resistance to do so. It goes back into what Alvarez, that we started with, Alvarez versus the Brownsville, city of Brownsville, if that individual had gone to trial, uh, maybe his 1983 action would have prevailed because there would have been certain, one of the things in the opinion was there's certain protections that, the, that an individual receives at trial that he loses once he pleads. And that's super scary. That is super scary. If you don't know, especially with the corruption down in, down in the valley and things that go on behind closed doors, when we know it happens. Um, yeah, I, mean, but, I mean, God, rolling the dice on some, you know some cop did some shady stuff and you, and you can't prove it, and they're offering you a deal or you take it to trial because maybe later on in the future you could be exonerated in some way, but not if you get a horrible writ lawyer because apparently you're going to lose that now. <laughs> um, yeah, because you can be ineffective. <laughs> yeah, we didn't yeah. have time to get to that. <laughs> Which uh, is a great topic, by the way. I know. I mean, it's, just, it, it, it's crazy. It, it's it, the the system is just I don't know. Unfortunately, we just we we you, we got to keep fighting this stuff because it's the only way to hopefully make a change. I mean, look, had this lawsuit not been filed, we'd just be still rolling along in the in the same old same old down in misdemeanor court, you know. And I'd like to back up uh, since we're about to wrap up here the the challenge as well. Bail bondsmen, judiciary, call, call in, come to the show. We want to we want to hear this side. We'd love to. To have a conversation, and I challenge anyone, any of y'all, to come on the show. Just, I mean, I, I endorse Pat's challenge. I hope it treated you nice, Megan. Yeah, it was fun. We, we, we didn't scare you off from coming back on the show. No, I like nerding out about this stuff. You like nerd? Oh, oh, now we're total nerds. nerding out. Now we're nerding totally out. Nerd. Did I, oh. <laughs> is that okay? Is <laughs> no, this is totally cool. <laughs> I, I've just never been called, you know, been told I was nerding out on to, this. To your stuff. face. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, right? <laughs> I have. It's, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I'm going to nerd out any time. Um, do what, Pat? You got one last Thanks for thought? Thanks for having I've said my piece. This is a wrong system. It's time it was overturned, and I hope every judge that sits there and fights this goes down. Yep. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, 2018 is the year that it might go down. That's all the time we have for tonight, ladies and gentlemen, for Julio Vela, Pat McCann, and Megan Flynn. We will see you next week. Good night.